peace and blessing be upon all of you. My name is Mansoor Khan, and I am serving the MDA Muslim Community Connecticut as president. It is our tradition that we start the program with the recitation of the Holy Quran. A'uzu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahi rahmanir rahim. Yusabbihu lillahi ma fis samawati wa ma fil ar. Al-Malikul Quddus Al-Aziz Al-Hakim Huwa al-lazi ba'atha fil ummi yina rasulam min hum Yatlu alayhim ayati Yatlu alayhim ayati Wa yuzakihim Wa yu'alimuhum al-kitab wal-hikmah وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Jazakallah. Translation of what I just recited, uh, Quran chapter um, 62, verse 1 to 3. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. Whatever is in the heavens, and whatever is in the earth glorifies Allah, the sovereign, the holy, the mighty, the wise. He it is who has raised among the unlettered people a messenger from among themselves who recites unto them his signs and purifies them and teaches them the book and wisdom. Although they had been before in manifest guidance, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Peace and blessings be upon all of you. I will recite a few couplets from the Qasida, which is the glorification of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ya Rabbi salli ala nabiyyika daiman fi hazihi dunya wa ba'athin thani من ذكر وجهك يا هذه قط بحجتي جسمي يطير إلي لم أخل في اللهز ولا في يعني جسمي يطير إليك من شوق على يا ليت كانت قوة تيراني وقد كتفاك أول النها وبصدقهم ودعوا تذكر محد اللوطاني قد آثروك وفارقوا حبابهم وتباعدوا من حلكة الإخوان لا شك أنا محمد خير الورى ريق الكرام والنخبة الليان تمت عليه صفات كل مزية ختمت به نعماء كل زمان the poem you just heard is written by the founder of the Amdiya Muslim community, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan, India. He wrote this for the love of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him.
Today we are here to admire the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was respectful for everyone's faith. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, not only stressed the importance of tolerance in religious matter, but set a very high standard. A deputation from the Christian tribe of Najran visited him in Medina to exchange views on religious matters. It included several church dignitaries. The conversation was held in the mosque and it extended over several hours. At one point, the leader of deportation asked permission to depart from the mosque and to hold their religious services at some convenient location. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him said, there is no need for you to go out of the mosque because the mosque is the place to worship one God. If you want to do so, you have every freedom of worship and holding the services in it. Jazakallah, thank you, uh, President uh, Mansoor Khan Sahib. Uh, billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillah rahman rahim We begin in the name of God, the most gracious, the ever merciful. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for our celebration of the life and teachings of the Holy Founder of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, who has been called the most influential person in history by certain historians uh, because of how he turned around the dark ages. So I will go straight into our speakers and introducing them. We have a wonderful lineup of uh, speakers is going to be Rabbi Seth Reamer. He is from Temple Beth Torah in Wethersfield, and he has been a long-standing friend uh, of the Amity Muslim community. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom alaikum. Peace be upon you. Zahir honored me by asking me to respond from a Jewish perspective to a passage from Hadith, and here's my offering. I see strong similarities but also striking differences between the Muslim and Jewish prophetic outlooks. We read how the prophet Muhammad was persecuted for his commitment to bear holy witness. This motif is consistent with and beautifully echoes at times even more loudly than what Jewish prophetic literature propounds. Like his Jewish prophetic forebears, Muhammad does not let his sufferings at the hands of his fellow man sidetrack him from his from a militantly holy commitment. Because this prophet, like his Hebrew predecessors, puts his trust entirely in God, no mortal influence will deflect him from the holy mission. He thus declares, sufficient unto me is Allah, there is no God but he, in him is my trust, the Lord of the glorious throne. Muhammad's teachings reflect the same ethical compunction we find in Judaism's prophetic tradition for example, his view of marriage is like what we read from the Torah's mosaic revelation and later rabbinic elaboration about presenting the bond between man and woman as a covenant in which respect for one's wife's human dignity is paramount. Be ever mindful, the prophet declares, of the duty you owe to Allah in respect of your wives. Again, just as Jewish prophets in almost modern pluralistic fashion railed against social division leading to injustice. Muhammad states, Allah has made you brethren one to another. So be not divided. An Arab has no preference over a non-Arab nor a non-Arab over an Arab, nor is a white one to be preferred to a dark one nor a dark one to a white one. There's a variance, however. The Jewish prophets remained lonely, unpopular figures. Hebrew scripture presents all too few instances of public acclamation for them and a gloomy undercurrent, even pessimism about what we can expect in the short term runs through Jewish holy texts, which concentrate more on our failure than our ability to live up to our religious ideals. Ultimate vindication does not typically come from the biblical prophets contemporaries or in their generation. 
The persecution continues. The misunderstanding persists relentlessly and pursues them sometimes to their death, as we hear reported, for instance, of Jeremiah. By contrast, Muhammad, I'm quoting, was now surrounded by an ocean of faithful, devoted hearts, all proclaiming the glory of Allah, celebrating his praise, affirming his unity, supplicating him for forgiveness, mercy, compassion, invoking his blessings upon Muhammad. A partial exception is Moses, Moshe, the greatest of Jewish prophets, and perhaps the closest figure in Judaism to Muhammad. Yes, Moses' people's refusal to heed his instructions leads to his own unfulfilled tragic end. He loses God's trust, and having been refused God's permission to enter the promised land, dies longingly on its verge. During his life, he is, as are so many of the Israelite prophets who follow him, the frequent object of unfair criticism. His wisdom is often spurned, his motives reviled, his warnings mocked, his efforts to set his people on the right path ignored. Yet, he remains, like Muhammad, a hopeful soul, sparing no effort to educate his flock and ameliorate their values and Israel's recognition of Moses' unceasing devotion toward them, his desire to shepherd them through the forbidding wilderness leads them to profoundly mourn his death. In embracing hope in the face of objective realities, he can't ignore Moses serves as an inspiring role model for the later prophets of Israel and Judah, and I dare say for the prophet Muhammad himself. Other meaningful correspondences between these towering figures, Moshe, Moses, and Muhammad exist. An echo of Moses' anxious solicitude for his flock comes in the de declaration of the prophet Muhammad. You will soon appear before your Lord and he will call you to account for all your doings. Take heed that you do not go astray after I am gone and start slaying one another. And just as Moses is almost obsessed with proving his revulsion against the notion that people might think he used his high position to intimidate others or enrich himself. We read the following about Muhammad. All blood feuds are utterly wiped out. I hereby remit everything owed to any member of my family on that account. Reba interest has been declared unlawful and is no longer due. I hereby remit any interest due to any member of my family. For instance, all interest due to my uncle. Notice how specific he is. Abbas ben Abdul um, Mutalib is remitted altogether. Moreover, upon his death, Moses is buried in an undisclosed location. Rabbis say the reason is to prevent that place from being turned into a shrine where we might go to worship Moses as if he were, God forbid, a god. This is similar perhaps to the Muslim prohibition against depicting Muhammad, lest, God forbid, such images were turned into idols. So there are undeniable parallels between the two, despite Muhammad's much greater this worldly success than Moses's. That difference, though, Jews' skepticism about political triumph in the here and now, juxtaposed with Muslims' confidence in it, along with the others, that difference along with the others in which Jewish prophets never quite succeed in getting their message across to their people. But the prophet Muhammad does live to see establishment of the beloved community and take full charge of it, underscores a profound theological disagreement between the two traditions. The Jewish prophet is, like Moses and later Isaiah, a theoretical and exilic consciousness, a voice crying in the wilderness. The prophet Muhammad does experience exile, but actually returns from it to triumphant acclaim. From where I stand, the Messianic Kingdom's foundations seem to be, for Muslims, through your blessed prophet's visions and actions already in place. You know, even without the messianic conclusion, it's already in place. Jews, for our part, haven't yet laid the rebuilt temple's foundation stone in place. We really appreciate your uh, inspirational, insightful words.
Uh, thank you for having the courage and uh, having the inner faith love to join us and say those words. Thank um, you for, for the same. Pastor Joy Perkett, and uh, she hails from the First Baptist Church in Essex. I greet you with grace. Thank you for the honor of having me gather with you tonight. I am thankful to be here to celebrate the gifts with you given by the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. I am moved by the Prophet's groundbreaking vision of religious freedom. In 622 CE, the prophet drew up the constitution of Medina, which gave religious freedom as a right. This occurred well over a millennia before the West or Christendom could dream of such an advancement. Many historians consider the Constitution of Medina to be the first document in history to establish religious freedom as a right. A peaceful endeavor, the Constitution sought to end bitter fighting between rival clans and to promote peaceful cooperation with all other Medina groups. Several clauses also deal with the relationship between the Muslim community and the Jewish tribes, stating that each group has a right to practice its religion freely. It also ensured representatives of all parties, Muslims and non-Muslims, be present when consulting or negotiating with foreign states. I love that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had the fundamental vision of people of all different backgrounds cooperating together. As an American Baptist Christian, this wows me. American Baptist formed as a reaction to King Henry VIII and the religious wars in England following the formation of the Church of England. In the face of great violence and persecution, Baptists centered their own tradition around tenets of religious freedom and soul freedom. My specific tradition and Christendom has only begun to learn in the last couple centuries what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had the vision to foresee in the seventh century. Our entire country would do well to remember and honor and form ourselves by this vision of multi-religious cooperation and freedom that he gifted. I am thankful for the ways he opened the path to other multi-religious states of people dwelling together, like ours today. I am thankful for the vision he had of what was needed. I am thankful for the ways his followers today continue to live out that vision of interfaith cooperation. I see it in the ways that you included me in the event tonight. I see it in the ways that the House of Peace Mosque and my church have collaborated on past events, including vigils, talks, and dinners. I see it, the, the mosque I, am, I have contact with is House of Peace, so I see it in the ways that that mosque does blood drives and donates food, and even through their forgiveness gen given gener generously, shows me uh, how they live out their faith to people of other religious backgrounds or no religious backgrounds at all. That work matters. It plants a seed in our community for life to flourish. I pray that all of our communities continue to work for the precious gifts of freedom, of peace, and of just co coexistence. And I am so grateful to the Ahmadiyya community and for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon us, for leading that way. Thank you, uh, Pastor, for your beautiful words and unifying words. And uh, 
of course, yes, we remember our interfaith events together. And uh, of course, as Muslims, we honor Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus, the Messiah, peace be upon them. So our, our next uh, speaker, and we look forward to more events in the future, <laughs> more engagements. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Andres Mohammed Alfonso, and he serves as Middletown Public Schools World Languages Department Chair. And uh, he was not only my Spanish teacher, but my brother's, as well as uh, Sheikh's Spanish teacher, as well as some Wajid and uh, Zahid's uh, teacher as well. So please, Mr. Alfonso, enlighten us. Good evening, everyone, and peace be on to you, everyone. I am coming to speak to you tonight about the on the Ashtimanti of Muhammad. And it's also colloquially known as the Covenant of Muhammad. In this document, um, the Prophet uh, granted protections and other uh, privileges to the um, followers of Jesus of Nazareth, um, the, the Christian monks uh, of St. Catherine and Mount Sinai uh, under Muslim rule in 638. Several pieces of this document really jumped out to me, so I want to just read some of the passages to all of you. Um, so this is the message from Muhammad, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. As a covenant to those who, who adopt Christianity near and far, we are with them. No one is to destroy a house of the religion, to damage it, or to carry anything from it to the Muslim houses. No one is to force them to travel or to oblige them to fight. The Muslims are to fight for them. And finally, the last piece that sticks with me is their churches are to be respected. They are neither to be prevent, um, prevented from repairing them nor the sac uh, sorry sacredness of their covenants. And no one of the nation of uh, Muslims is to uh, disobey the covenant till the end of the world. So um, there is this vision that uh, the Prophet Muhammad has six, uh, 1,381 years ago about this partnership, about this bu bridge building between Muslims and Christians. Although at this particular time, it was it, it was this group of monks living on Mount Sinai, I think it's pr pretty uh, present impression of him um, because th that these are one of the things that we are currently discussing, talking about, working with in this collaboration, this partnership of uh, interfaith dialogue, working through you know th these the ebbs and flows that happen within you know religious movements and understandings uh, within each other. I, I echo some of the things that uh, the other presenters said because I think they're a lot in, in line with each other. Um, there is this understanding that, you know, the, the for religious freedom, these sort of ideals that uh, oftentimes, when we, you know, when there are discussions about, you know, or misunderstandings about Islam as a religion, there is this partnership that has always existed between, which is between Christianity and Islam that I think is people are either aren't aware of or they don't delve deeper into just that they stay at the surface level. And I think that this uh, this document, this, this really gives us a real understanding of, you know, 1,381 years ago, see, in, in, someone thought, you know, I'm going to put this in writing. And this covenant doesn't end when I die. This covenant is going to continue on for, the, for, the, for eternity. So um, in conclusion, <laughs> um, although the contract was written and executed, you know, 1,381 years ago, it's still very relevant today as it continues to be the foundation of Muslim and Christian finding uh, common ground, uh, understanding and how to peacefully coexist, support, engage and learn from one another uh, as the Prophet Muhammad intended did and he did during his lifetime. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and speak with you. Thank you, Mr. Alfonso, for your encouraging words and uh, for all of you for having the bravery to um, you know, put the love and effort into this um, and celebrating our prophet with us. Um, now we come to the keynote address um, by our respected uh, Imam Salman Tariq, who is a regional missionary for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Imam Salman Tariq. Peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa shadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolu. 
This is the Arabic that we usually, uh, whenever we are uh, speaking or giving sermons, we recite, glorifying the name of Allah, that He is one, He is the only one that is worthy of worship and Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is the messenger of him. There are many prophecies uh, in the Holy Quran which were fulfilled at the time of Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. <clears throat> and uh, there were many prophecies that were fulfilled in last 1400 years after, Holy, after the demise of Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And they continue to fulfill. And uh, among such is the prophecy that was recently fulfilled again. Allah Almighty told us 1400 years ago in the Holy Quran. And he told this to Muslims that we will hear hurtful, uh, hurtful things. In chapter 3, verse 187, God Almighty says that you shall surely be tried of your in your possessions and in your persons and you shall surely hear many hurtful things and he gave the solution to this in the next part of the words he said he said but if you show fortitude and act righteously that indeed is a matter of strong determination so we have in in the recent past uh, a couple of months ago we got to know what happened in France. Uh, Samuel Paty, a French middle school teacher, showed cartoons of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And uh, he was killed by a perpetrator or so-called Muslim Russian refugee. And we, of course, we condemned at that time and we condemn any act of violence and the killing of any innocent soul. The French president reacted by displaying these cartoons on governmental buildings in the name of freedom of speech. And there were many uh, who condemned uh, his action. And we heard the good words from uh, Prime Minister of Canada and many other politicians as well. And amongst them was uh, one Pakistani human rights minister as well. And because of the pressure, you know, they had to take or delete the tweet uh, from the Twitter. So we see that all this is done in the name of freedom of speech and the freedom of expression. In order, uh, in order for us to uh, properly understand what was the character and the example, the model of Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that what is going on in the world against Islam, against Muslims. And when we hear such things, what was the example of Holy Prophet, peace be upon him? We find many examples. Abu Jahl, who was the leader of Meccans, and he used to call Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He used to call him, instead of calling him Muhammad, he used to call him Muhammadum. Uh, Muhammad, Muhammad. So this means despised one, God forbid. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, used to reply, he used to smile and he used to say that, I don't know uh, who he is calling because my name is Muhammad. We see that the Quraysh, the people of Mecca, they would put uh, animal uh, carcasses on, the, on his back while he's praying in, in, in the mosque. And what was his reaction? He was beaten, he was strangled, he was stoned, and he was sore upon, and many assassination stamps were made on his life. We find that uh, in the Holy Quran, God Almighty told him that uh, do not follow the disbelievers and do not follow the hypocrites and leave alone any uh, annoyance. But you only put the trust in God Almighty. 
and Allah is sufficient and he is the guardian. And this persecution and all this was not confined to his uh, self only, but also we find uh, happening happened with his family members as well. His daughter, Hazrat Zainab, who was at that time was carrying a grandchild of Holy Prophet peace upon him in her womb when she was killed. His uncle, Hazrat Hamza, his, uh, his cousin, Hazrat Jafar, and many others, they were killed. So how did Holy Prophet peace be upon him respond? So ultimately, when he had all the power to execute these people, especially on the day of the conquest of Makkah, that was the time when he had the power. And uh, he came and he said, La tasriba alaykum al yom, that today no blame shall be lie on you that I forgive all of you, what, whatever you have done. So this is what uh, he taught to us. So when we see the, uh, the improper reaction of uh, certain Muslims, of course that we know that they are not following the examples of Holy Prophet peace be upon him, rather they gave an opportunity for the opponents to defame Islam. And uh, this Russian refugee uh, or any other perpetrator who commits the act of violence, definitely, you know, they have, uh, they don't know uh, what Islam is and what Holy Prophet peace be upon him taught us. Yes, in recent past, uh, there was a terror trial in the UK. Uh, Ahmad Hassan, who was, uh, who tried to blow up a packed tube train in in, in Parsons Green in West London, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with the recommendation that he serves a minimum of 34 years. And when we read the remarks of uh, Mr. Justice Hayden, beautiful remarks he has given. He said that finally, Ahmad Hassan, let me say this to you. You will have plenty of time to study the Quran in prison in the years to come. You should understand that the Quran is the book of peace. Islam is a religion of peace. The Quran and Islam forbids anything extreme, including extremism in religion. Islam forbids breaking the law of the land where one is living or is a guest. Islam forbids terrorism. The Quran and the Sunnah, the practice of Holy Prophet peace be upon him, provide that the crime of, of perpetrating terror to cause corruption in the land is one of the most severe crimes in Islam. So it is the law of the United Kingdom. You have therefore received the most severe of sentence under the law of this land. You have violated the Quran and Islam by your actions as well as the law of all civilized people. It is to be hoped that you will come to realize this one day. So this is the teaching of Islam beautifully pointed out by Mr. Justice Hayden in his remarks. So in order for us to <clears throat> fully understand what the Holy Prophet peace be upon him has given to this world, we must go back and learn about pre-Islamic era and what was the condition of the Arabs at that time. In the fifth or sixth centuries, people in general were ill-mannered, unlettered and ignorant. And the vices of alcoholism, gambling, oppression, violence, cruelty and various other wrongdoings were the order of the day. And Slavery was common and they would treat slaves worse than animals. And the treatment of women in pre-Islamic Arabia and uh, in the rest of the world, the condition of women was equal, equal to that of slaves and cattle with no rights. They had no right to inherit or to say anything. And they had uh, no real status in the society. And they were considered worthless and were often killed at birth. And they were given uh, very little education or no education at all. 
So, and we have many uh, stories that we read that how two people are fighting and on a minor thing. And from that, the fight starts and, you know, that fight um, goes on for many years and the country, the two tribes and the nations get, gets involved. And not only this, that when they used to fight, they would destroy everything and they, will, they would kill everyone. We see that uh, the difference that when Holy Prophet peace upon him came and what he has done, the rights that he has given to women. And uh, uh, we, we see that uh, during the, he laid down the rules of the wars. When they were going for the defensive wars, they, he made sure, he told this to, the, to his companions, every single person who was going for war, that make sure that you should not kill any, uh, any, any children, women, religious leader, you should not kill, uh, cut the trees, or destroy the places of worship, etc. So he, those people were godless people, idolaters. After accepting Holy Prophet peace be upon him, they became God-fearing people. And the most important change that Holy Prophet peace be upon him brought for women was to raise their spiritual status. And Holy Prophet peace be upon him laid down that education is compulsory for both. And he would often say that if a father took it upon himself to educate his daughters and care for their upbringing, God will save him from the hellfire. And he abolished slavery. He said to the Muslims that uh, slaves are your brothers and you should feed them and clothe them uh, with the same type of clothes you wear and the same food you, you eat. And for, we find many examples once in the market, one companion was coming with his slave and uh, they both were wearing the same clothes. And someone saw them and he asked, he was shocked and he asked that your slave is wearing the same clothes as yours. And he said, didn't you hear the Holy Prophet peace be upon him? Bilal, who was the companion of Holy Prophet peace be upon him, he was an African slave. From Bilal, he became Sayyidna Bilal. Sayyidna means our master, our Lord, our leader. And we see that uh, uh, amongst those slaves, they became the leaders. They became the leaders of the armies. So the question on the side note, one question arises that why didn't he free all the slaves? We find that you know, the companions freed thousands of slaves, but this was, there was a wisdom behind not to free all the slaves at once because this is the atmosphere that he was creating to let the companions know how to treat them. And once they are ready to go out and work themselves and uh, earn and then they were freed. And we find that the third caliph, we know that he freed thousands of slaves in one day. And we find uh, the, uh, his teaching is about equality. This was one of the last message that he has given, that no one is superior to other. For the promised Messiah, the reformer of this age, he has said that when we look at the kind of people they were and how they be behaved before they accepted Islam and how they were transformed by the company of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and by submission to the Holy Quran, and how in respect to their morals, their beliefs, their behavior, their conduct, and all their practices, they rid themselves of their evil condition and enter into a pure and immaculate state. And when we look at the wonderful influence which brought a strange, uh, strange light and radiance to their rusty beings, we have to concede that they, this change was indeed miraculous. And it was brought about especially by the hands of God. So during the time of Holy Prophet peace be upon him, a Jew and an Arab were arguing, uh, arguing over superiority of their respective prophets. So the Jews' sentiments were hurt by the way the Muslim made his claim 
And he complained this to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, admonished the Muslims' behavior. And he said that, do not exalt me above, Muslim, above Moses. So this was the high standard of tolerance and courtesy that Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, required from all the Muslims, all his followers. And to achieve this unity among nations of the world, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has given us a golden rule of respecting and honoring the founders of holy men of, of various faiths. And if we do not follow this golden rule, it has the potential of uh, creating mutual enmity and ill will, which destroy the peace of the society. And we have witnessed this recently and uh, in the past as well, all around the world. What is our responsibility? Mirza Masood Ahmad, may Allah be his helper, our spiritual leader, our, our caliph, he has stated, and he said that a few years ago, when the cartoons portraying the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, were first published in Denmark and then again in France, momentary hue and cry arose. An announcement of boycott were made from amongst Muslims. And then just as quickly, within a few months, everything died down. And nothing further was said by the majority of the Muslims. And he said that the exception was that Ahmadiyya Muslim community who stood alone by responding in the true Islamic fashion, by demonstrating to the world the true and beautiful character of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And this was our reaction and will always be our response. So I, I remember I was in Missouri, St. Louis and uh, some Muslim groups, they have contacted us. They came to our mosque and they told us that uh, if uh, we can join them in the protest, in the marches against uh, what, what has done, what they have done in the Denmark and France. And we told them that our response is different. We do not uh, take this on the street, but our response is different. And this is our response, that we teach this to our fellow Americans and to the world and show them through our uh, actions what, uh, what is the teaching of, uh, of Islam and the beautiful example of Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. So our spiritual leader, he continues and he says that an Ahmadi, uh, in this era, which is the era of promised Messiah, the reformer of the age, it is all the more important that rather than violence, focus is put on prayers and invoking blessings as well as to try to reform oneself. To scrutinize your inner self as to how much do we love the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. This is our response. He says, an Ahmadi tries to make personal effort to inform the world of the reality as opposed to this conspiracy and present the beautiful aspect of the blessed model of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. An Ahmadi tries to demonstrate the blessed example of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, through his or her every act. And everyone should make their action a practical model of Islamic teachings. And this is the beautiful response we should give. So may God Almighty enable all of us to follow these beautiful examples and teachings of Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and to show true picture of Islam to our fellow Americans and uh, to the whole world through our actions. I mean. Jazakallah, Imam Zulman Dari, uh, for that beautiful and uh, timely uh, address. Um, may we uh, put that into practice uh, what uh, Reverend Joy, Rabbi Seth, uh, Mr. Alfonso, Imam Salman Tariq uh, has brought to us and uh, uh, taught us uh, and how to respond <clears throat> to any kind of hatred. The uh, closing remarks um, by our Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Qureshi, Vice President of the Amadiya Muslim Community, he also serves as the Director of Operations for Humanity First USA.
Dr. Quraysh. So, Azubillah, Amir Shaitan, Rajim, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. I was really um, excited about the fact that uh, Reverend Joy, uh, Rabbi Seth, who's been one of my best friends uh, for many, many years, probably over a decade, more than a decade. And then uh, Mr. Alfonso uh, brought forth and, and uh, put together um, uh, some very insightful um, you know, aspects of uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That means peace be upon him. But I wanted to um, uh, just reiterate what uh, our Imam Salman Tariq Sahib just said. And that is that not only do we have to respect all of our, all of, all of the prophets that were the founders of Mosaic uh, or Christian or any of the other faiths, we have to believe in them. We have to make them part of our faith. We can never say anything against Jesus, Islam, Prophet, you know, peace be upon him, or Moses, uh, Prophet, peace be upon him, or Abraham, or Krishna, or Buddha, because we believe that as a Muslim, if we don't believe in any one of them, we are not a Muslim. So that's part of faith, and I just wanted to make sure that came across. Um, uh, and then if you believe and have faith in them, how can you disrespect them? So we can never disrespect any uh, prophet. But if you look at the events of this month in United States, our firm belief is that as a Muslim, we have to emulate our life in, in the same guise as the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we, we have been instructed in the Quran to live our life like the way he did. And it is the attributes of his life that we have to follow. Not, you know, because he was 1400 years ago, we have to look at his conscious, how he treated others, how he treated his family. And that's going to be our, our guide. We don't have to follow anybody else. You know, we don't have to follow any other Muslims if they're doing anything wrong or negative. The only instruction is for following the Prophet Muhammad. So then the question comes in, all right, we are sitting here in America, you know, 1400 years away or 1500 years away from the time when he was there. How is it relevant? It is relevant because look at where our country is now. Our country is divided almost a 50, 50 percent, you know, f between two groups of people. We call them the red states and the blue states. And the enmity between the two groups was evidence on 6th of January. What a small community like us can bring forth to our fellow countrymen. We can bring the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how he was able to bridge the divide that was present in his time between the Arabs, those Arabs that had accepted the Prophet Muhammad, which were in a minority and those Arabs who had not accepted him and hated him like anything. And that example was highlighted by Imam Salman Tariq and uh, by the other speakers as well. And it was at its peak at the time of the fall of Mecca. Mecca was a town which had kicked out the Prophet Muhammad from it. He was born in that town, he was kicked out. And then God gave him the strength to come back with 10,000 of his followers, he could have, the, the, the same people who killed his daughter who was pregnant, the same people who killed his uncle, just it was mentioned, the same people who killed majority of his family members, they were put in, in like almost like a prison for three years without food and water. He, and then they had brought big armies to attack him, the Battle of Ditch in Medina, which was they surrounded the town where he had fled to or gone to, and it was about to be destroyed uh, by these Meccans. They were going to kill each one of them. But when he gets the chance, he comes and he says, and he forgives them. And he says, and he sees, uses the example, and the example is, he uses is of Prophet Joseph, the Judaic Prophet Joseph, who also forgave his brothers. But you know what he did, which was another aspect of it, is that the people who were persecuted the most in the followers of Prophet Muhammad when he was in Mecca were the Africans. 
the African individuals who had accepted him, who were treated the most in the most painful and hurtful way. So when he was forgiving the Arabs, people would have said, well, they were his brothers or they were his, you know, they were his clansmen. So he wanted to make sure that the African group of people who had accepted him were also given an opportunity to take their, um, to, 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 so that their hearts are not broken. So he created a flag, what is called the flag of Bilal. And Bilal was the foremost African slave who had accepted the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And he said, anybody who comes under this flag will be forgiven. So he didn't take away the forgiveness, but he also make sure, made sure that those people who were persecuted the most because of their skin color were also treated fairly and were given the opportunity to, to, get for, uh, to, to do good to the people. So this example of forgiveness, this example of reaching out to the opposite group is an example for us, the community in the United States now. How can we bridge this gap? How can we show love to those people who, whose president lost an election, who think that they were deceived? And how do we build that bridge? And that is by showing increased patience and forgiveness to that group. And hopefully our good behavior will bridge that divide and bridge that gap that is existing in the United States. And I think our president, our new president Biden is trying to do that, but we wanna make sure we reach out to those people who are under honor influence who belong to the opposite group. With this, I really thank um, Rabbi Seth again. Thank you again and again. Um, you're always um, you know, there for us. And uh, Reverend Joy, wonderful, you know, and one of our very good friends and hope we can visit your uh, church once again in the beautiful uh, area uh, in the Southern Connecticut. And then um, Mr. Alfonso, thank you for your um, insightful words and all the guests that are there. And if you have any questions, please um, raise your hand and we'll give you a few more minutes to just, um, you know, so that we can answer uh, your questions. But thank you for giving your time on a Sunday evening. And, um, you know, and this is without food, believe me. <laughs> so we appreciate you joining us for this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Qureshi for your pragmatic words. And um, this really event has uh, put tears in my eyes and um, I'm sure we can take something from this. I, I really appreciate the invitation to come. I've learned a lot tonight. There's a lot of history that is not being taught about the uh, Prophet Muhammad. And I think that is something that is missing. And if we don't know about the Prophet Muhammad and the, more about the Islamic and, and the Muslim faith, we, then there's only intolerance and being people who are being scared of each other and not loving each other. Allahumma amin. Peace be with you.